Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis and today we have the video number 12 on fluids, electrolytes and acid-base disturbance and today we're gonna talk about how your kidney regulates your extracellular fluid volume so let's get started. Make sure to watch these videos before this one because this one will never make sense. In the last video we talked about isotonic, hypotonic and hypertonic disorder. It was a crazy video in a good sense. As you know the internal environment of your body is not the ICF. The internal environment is the ECF. The extracellular fluid is your internal environment. Why? Because your cells live in that extracellular fluid. So if this is your cell and this is your extracellular fluid basically your cells are bathing in this extracellular fluid so that's why it's the internal environment that's why regulation of the extracellular fluid volume is very important how does your body regulate it first thirst mechanisms we have talked about it in video number 10 about osmolality and tonicity renin angiotensin aldosterone system baroreceptors found in the aortic arch and in the carotid sinus and in many other places but those are the two major ones adh acting on v1 and v2 receptors as well as reabsorption of salt and water by your amazing kidney there is a concept called effective arterial blood volume what's that this is the portion of the ECF that's inside a blood vessel. So as you know, your total body water is about 60% of your total body weight. Two thirds of that is in the intracellular fluid and one third is in the extracellular fluid. Of that one third, you have one fourth in the plasma. This is the effective arterial blood volume and three fourths are in the interstitial space. This effective arterial blood volume corresponds to the extracellular fluid volume and the total body sodium generally speaking so if the effective arterial blood volume is low you can deduce that extracellular fluid volume is low and the total body sodium is low example hemorrhage when you have hemorrhage how about the extracellular fluid volume of course you're bleeding it's low how about the total body sodium you're bleeding plasma which has salt and water so you're bleeding sodium so total body sodium is going to be low what do you expect the effective arterial blood volume will be? Low, you're bleeding blood from your arterial blood or from, or from your blood generally. So if effective arterial blood volume is high on the other hand, you can deduce that extracellular fluid volume is high and total body sodium is high. Example infusion of a 3% saline, 3% salt solution because your doctor is an idiot. What will happen is they are infusing sodium chloride solution. So they are infusing more salt than water. Total sodium is gonna be high, of course. Extracell fluid volume is gonna be high, absolutely. And the effective arterial blood volume is gonna be high, okay. However, there is an exception to every rule. Just because the extracell fluid volume is high does not necessarily mean that the effective arterial blood volume is high. Why not? Remember? CHF, congestive heart failure. It's a volume overload state, yet the effective arterial blood volume is low. Why? Because blood or fluid is escaping from your blood compartment, from your plasma compartment to the interstitial space, causing pitting edema, leaving less effective arterial blood volume in the freaking artery or the freaking vessel. So just because the ECF volume is high doesn't mean that the effective arterial blood volume is going to be high and CHF is a good example. You have alteration of startling forces, increased hydrostatic pressure in the vessel, um, moving fluid outside of the vessel to the interstitial space, causing a pitting edema. When fluid moves from here to here to the interstitial space, the effective arterial blood volume is going to be low. So some words of wisdom, even though CHF is a volume overload state, the effective arterial blood volume is low. Oh my goodness, this is profound. So to regulate the extracellular fluid volume, we depend on those five mechanisms. So let's talk about them. Baroreceptors, they are pressure receptors. They respond to stretch. 
and they are found in most of the big vessels, especially the aortic arch and the carotid sinus. What the flip is the carotid sinus? You know that you have the common carotid artery. It branches into the internal carotid and the external carotid arteries. And at the beginning of the external carotid artery, there is like a bulb, okay? There is like a enlargement. We call this the carotid sinus. And then there is a body here called the carotid body. The carotid body and the carotid sinus are very close, but they are not the same thing. Carotid sinus, just an enlargement. Carotid body is an actual thing there. Cool. So let's say that you have a decreased extracellular fluid volume, which means you have a decreased effective arterial blood volume, which means you have a decreased blood pressure because you know pressure is force over an area. When you have less volume, okay, you have less pressure. Let's say that we have five men knocking on the door. And then I'm telling you, we will have only two men knocking on the same door. So the surface area is the same. Now the pressure on the door when two men are knocking is less because we have less force manifesting itself on the surface area called the door. So the pressure is gonna decrease. Makes sense. Now the carotid sinus and the carotid bodies are gonna sense, ooh, we have a decreased pressure, danger, danger. So now they are sending an afferent nerve, small herring's nerve, which nobody has heard about because you are wasting your time on Facebook instead of learning crazy names of nerves like this small herring's nerve. And it's a branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve going to the center. Where's the center? Of course, it's your brain. Please be specific. It's the medulla oblongata. Please be more specific. It's the nucleus tractus solitarius, baby. Once it goes to the center, it will go to the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus say, oh, less blood pressure. Let's secrete ADH trying to constrict the blood vessel using the V1 receptor and trying to retain water at the kidney using the V2 receptor and aquaporin to water channels. That nucleus in the hypothalamus is the supraoptic. Back to the medulla oblongata and we are sending an efferent sympathetic, not from the medulla, I know that sympathetic is thoracolumbar, so yeah, from the thoracolumbar area, whatever, and they go to the heart. Of course, the heart is autonomous, it pumps on its own, but we can increase and decrease the heart rate. Okay, these nerve fibers secrete epinephrine or epinephrine to the heart, and they will increase the heart rate. Because we have less blood pressure, let's pump more. Let's increase the contractility of the heart. Let's constrict the arterioles and the veins. When you constrict arterioles, it's going to increase the diastolic pressure. And when you constrict veins, it's going to increase the venous return to the heart, which is going to pump more blood strongly. Cool. This will increase blood pressure and back to normal. Very well done. That's why we call baroreceptors pressure buffer system. Amazing. On the other hand, let's say that you have lots of extracellular fluid volume, which means the effective arterial blood volume is high and your blood pressure is high. Use this freaking physics equation. The carotid sinus is going to sense the change. Efferent nerve fiber, which is the small herring's nerve, which is a branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve, going to the center of the brain. Now, no ADH, baby. But the efferent here is not the sympathetic, it's the freaking parasympathetic, the vagus baby nerve coming from your medulla oblongata. Going to the heart and secreting acetylcholine through the M2 muscarinic receptors, decreasing your heart rate, decreasing your contractility, decreasing the tone of the vessels, meaning vasodilation of arterioles and veins. This will lead to decreased your blood pressure and back to normal. That's why we call the baroreceptors pressure buffer system. Let's take it to the next level, integration, baby. Carotid sinus syndrome. Those patients have baroreceptors that are so sensitive. Mild external pressure over the neck, such as shaving or applying makeup, will provoke a strong baroreceptor reflex. They sense this mild pressure as an extreme increase in blood pressure. They will send the vagus nerve efferent, leading to decreased heart rate, decreased contractility, and vasodilation. Actually, it can stop the heart for 5 to 10 seconds. The patient may faint. It's very dangerous. If you suffer from carotid sinus syndrome, of course, you should talk to your doctor. And you should thank God that your classmates at 5th grade 
haven't heard of Carl Sinus syndrome because they have they would have tortured you. They were just like pressing on your neck to make you faint. It will be a disaster. I've talked about ADH in video number 10. In brief, ADH acts on the tubules using the V2 receptors, opening aquaporin to protein channels for water. Water flows from the tubule to the peritubular capillaries. This is called reabsorption, but it's pure water. It's water without electrolytes. It's the free water. It's the facultative water. Free to choose using V2 receptor. As you know, there are two types of water, obligated and free. We have talked about thirst sensation before. We have talked about the baroreceptors and ADH. Now let's talk about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Let's say that your effective arterial blood volume is low, which means that blood flow to the afferent arterial is low. The juxtaglomeral cells, which are specific, specified, smooth muscle cells in the afferent arterial wall will sense this change and they will secrete renin. Renin will convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1, which is going to be converted into angiotensin 2 using ACE. Angiotensin 2 will lead to all of this crazy stuff, including vasoconstriction of the arterials, raising your blood pressure, aldosterone release, which reabsorbs salt and water, this reabsorption of fluid will increase your effective arterial blood volume, which cures the problem. So, in summary, when effective arterial blood volume is low, everything is going to be high. You drink more water, baroreceptors are firing sympathetic to increase the heart rate, increase contractility, increase the tone of blood vessels. Renin and angiotensin aldosterone systems are high. ADH is high as well as reabsorption of salt and water by the kidney. On the other hand, when effective arterial blood volume is high, everything is gonna be low. Also, when the effective arterial blood volume is high, other mechanisms will happen. Atrial natriuretic peptide, brain natriuretic peptide, prostaglandin A2, let's talk about ANP. ANP is released due to stretch of the atrium caused by volume overload, when both atrium are stretched they are secreting ANP it's called atrial because it's secreted from the atrium natriuretic peptide peptide because it's a peptide it's like a protein thing natriuretic natrium which is the freaking sodium Na we call sodium Na because it's natrium reuretic urea which means excretion in urine so this ANP is gonna excrete sodium in urine is called natriuretic the freaking name has the answer and then water will follow sodium what type of water is it it's obligated water let's talk about bnp brain natriuretic peptide exact same thing but released from the ventricles not the atria prostaglandin a2 will decrease adh release yeah why do you want adh when the effect of arterial blood volume is high you don't want adh it will decrease sodium reabsorption in the kidney. It will decrease the tone of blood vessels, specifically in the kidney, specifically the afferent arterial. It causes vasodilation. It's different from angiotensin 2 and norepi, which causes vasoconstriction. Reabsorption of GFR over the renal plasma flow. Example, normally, let's say that we have 100, they are coming here. 20 of them are going into the tubule or the filtrate and 80 are going to the peritubular capillary. Now calculate it, GFR over renal plasma flow, 20 over 100 is 20%. If you have prostaglandin E dilating the afferent, it increases the renal plasma flow. Now instead of 20, you have 30%. If you have angiotensin 2 constricting the efferent, all the plasma is flowing this way instead of this way. So the filtration fraction is high. Now the hydrostatic and oncotic pressure. If the capillary hydrostatic pressure is low and capillary oncotic pressure is high, this, this favors reabsorption. The opposite favors secretion. If you have decreased effect of arterial blood volume, the renal plasma flow is very low, GFR is slightly low, this increases the filtration fraction. I don't believe you. Okay, in cases of effective arterial blood volume, you have angiotensin 2 constricting the efferent, raising the filtration fraction. I still don't believe you. Okay, let's say that this 100 is now 70, and this 20 is 19. 19 over 70 is greater than 20%. Now, this 
decreased renal plasma flow is going to decrease the capillary hydrostatic pressure. There is less plasma in it. But the capillary oncotic pressure is relatively increased because plasma proteins are not filtered. This favors reabsorption. The opposite is also true favors secretion. When you have decreased effect of arterial blood volume, sodium is reabsorbed and the urine sodium is very low. But when you have increased effect of arterial blood volume, the sodium is lost in urine and urine sodium is high. Many of your professors don't understand the profundity of those two statements. Reabsorption of sodium and water, water here is obligated, at the proximal depends on the filtration fraction and the startling forces. But reabsorption of free water at the collecting tubule, which means water without electrolytes, depends on plasma osmolality or tonicity. And here is my 12th question for you, quiz time, so pause and let me know the answer in the comments. Did you know that now you can go to my Patreon page, click on video notes and choose hematology for example. You will see all of my hematology notes. There are like 150 of them. You can download them, print them, view them, do whatever you want. Go to patreon.com forward slash medicosis.